Hello lovely internet strangers. In today's video, I will be starting what is hopefully a new series where I discuss movies. I love watching movies, my husband and I watch movies together quite frequently, and something that I come across often are these woke takes on movies, these feminist critiques of movies that I used to eat up when I was a feminist, and now that I'm not, I find them profoundly annoying and really shallow analyses. I've had an idea to do this kind of series for a while, but I decided to launch it by talking about The Apartment, a film by Billy Wilder, because I still have the AV club in my feeds because I hate myself, but I also like to know what's going on in the entertainment world. And I saw this lovely piece about The Apartment with the words toxic masculinity in the title, because of course. And I have seen The Apartment. I love the film. I thought it was brilliant. And so I thought I would go through this article and talk about how it's wrong and just give a few of my thoughts on the apartment and what it's really about and what makes it great and why I don't think it's an indictment of toxic masculinity. All right, let's begin. The apartment premiered in the summer of 1960, three years before Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique kicked off second wave feminism and a decade before Kate Millett popularized the modern usage of the term patriarchy. Yet even though Billy Wilder's classic Oscar-winning romantic dramedy didn't have the language to describe the kind of toxic masculinity that flourishes at its central consolidation life insurance company, the film offers a prescient look at the way workplace boys clubs can oppress both women and men. Ah yes, patriarchy and toxic masculinity oppress women and men. Don't forget that. Instead of tear down the patriarchy, the apartment's rallying cry is, be a mensch, a human being. Like any good modern feminist worth her salt, she has to make the point that they just didn't know it was called toxic masculinity, but they were making a critique of it anyway. Obviously. The apartment is generally read more as commentary on toxic corporate culture than toxic masculinity, mostly because protagonist C.C. Baxter, played by Jack Lemmon, isn't a particularly patriarchal man. He takes his hat off in the elevator, he's polite to women, and he doesn't have the callous masculine swagger of his male higher-ups. Yet despite all that, Baxter still benefits from and uplifts patriarchy. He semi-begrudgingly arranged a system where he loans out his apartment for his boss's extramarital trysts, and they agree to fast-track his promotion. Soon enough, he's got his own office and a key to the executive washroom, so long as he grants his new boss, Jeff D. Sheldrake, played by Fred McMurray, use of the apartment, of course. Yes, the apartment is generally read more as commentary on toxic corporate culture because it is. It's not about men being dicks. It's about people in power using that power over other people. Is the way they're doing it a way that men are more likely to use it, i.e. to have affairs? Sure. But our protagonist is the man who is essentially the victim of this abuse of power. I mean, he's deciding to trade his integrity for for a promotion, which is like the entire point of the whole movie, that by the end of the movie, he makes a different choice. He realizes he's sacrificing his integrity and he decides to, as she referenced, be a mensch, be a human being. But you know, he benefits from and uplifts patriarchy. How is he uplifting patriarchy? He's letting his bosses have a space to have affairs. The women who are having the affairs are engaged in them willingly. I'm sure they're getting something out of it. Access to a powerful man, money, gifts, nice dinners, the sex I can't speak for. Are they being dicks to their wives? Sure. But at the same time, is it really affecting the wives' lives? They might not know. Are their husbands still paying all the bills and coming home? home and saying hi to the kids? Is it patriarchal because he only feels like he can do this because he's a man? Of course, she brings up the nice guy trope that the main character, Cece Baxter, is lonely and put upon that he discovers the woman his new boss is bringing back to his apartment is actually his office crush, plucky elevator girl, Fran Kublik. Nice guys, it seems, always finish last. So she references the dark turn the movie takes where the elevator girl he has a crush on on Fran after finding out that Baxter's boss is not going to leave his wife for her, that he's had multiple affairs. She tries to kill herself in Baxter's apartment because that's where the tryst was taking place. This writer says Fran's suicide attempt shifts the tone of the apartment, repositioning her, not Baxter, as its central tragic figure. The one who suffers the most under the patriarchal hierarchy that Baxter can at least sometimes benefit from. Yeah, because she wasn't benefiting. She wasn't having a relationship with a powerful man. She wasn't getting gifts from him, attending etc etc she's painted as someone who is lonely also she was getting benefits 
Let's not sweep that aside. So Baxter comes home and finds her, saves her. He has a neighbor who's a doctor who like pumps her stomach and helps him out. But he pretends to the doctor that he was sleeping with her. All his neighbors think that he's having all these different women over all the time because he's not going to tell them about his setup with all these executives at his company using his apartment for their affairs because that would probably be worse. So she says, It is Baxter sweetly helps the woman he loves. He's equally focused on protecting the married Sheldrake from public scandal. Baxter just can't accept that the man who gave him his swanky new promotion could be quite as heartless as his behavior suggests, even as Sheldrake is clearly more focused on ensuring Baxter's silence than making sure Fran is okay. Baxter is also concerned with his own reputation because it would not reflect well on him to his neighbors, to anyone, to know that he has compromised his integrity to the point that he is allowing this kind of behavior to go on in his apartment. And it's not like Fran is asking him to expose Sheldrake and he's like not doing it because patriarchy and he's silencing her me too shit. No. The apartment is at its sharpest when observing the banality of Sheldrake's cruelty. It isn't explicitly the story of a powerful man coercing his female subordinates, although there's an undercurrent of that at play when we learn that Sheldrake has a long history of office affairs, including with the woman he's dumped as a girlfriend but kept on as his silently suffering secretary. The apartment is also frank about the sexual harassment Fran experiences from skeevy executives in her elevator, but Wilder's focus is first and foremost on Sheldrake's subtle emotional gaslighting. All right, we'll get to that in a second. I love this implication that he's kept on his silently suffering secretary. Like she's a fucking slave and didn't decide to stay. She could go work at any other fucking office in the city that she wanted to, but she chose to stay here for whatever her fucking reasons are because she's still hung up on him, because she has too much pride to leave, because the money is too good, whatever. That's her fucking choice. He's not like keeping her there. What, would it be better if he fucked her and then fired her? This feminist would just be making a different argument then. He used her and then he ruined her career. Nowhere in this piece does this feminist acknowledge women's agency, aka women can decide to have affairs and they do. And there are benefits, like I said, attention, money, sex, the promise of something more. And that's the other thing that she doesn't want to admit. Why is Fran so naive that she thinks this man is going to leave his wife for her? Why are so many women naive that they think that men who are married are going to leave their wives for them, especially powerful ones? Like she really thinks that she's special somehow, that this man is not done this before. She's an adult. She has full possession of her faculties to make the decisions. She can go get with Cece Baxter if she wants, and she eventually does. All right, back to the subtle emotional gaslighting. Earlier in the film, when Sheldrick asked Fran to meet him at their secret rendezvous restaurant, she's clear-eyed about the fact that their relationship was just a summer fling while his wife and kids were away. Though she's still heartbroken about their split, it's nothing a new haircut and a little time won't fix. But then Sheldrick tells her he's planning to divorce his wife for her, and he's even visited a lawyer about it. So against her better judgment, Fran gets swept back into the affair and right into Baxter's apartment. It's this manipulative rekindling that proves near fatal. Again, I don't care. She got told by the secretary at the office that this man has had multiple affairs and he told her the same story and it wasn't true. The writer of this article even says against her better judgment. So she fucked up. She didn't trust her instincts, but she made a choice. Like, yeah, people can try to manipulate you, but you can have the backbone you can think for a second and be like, hmm, does this seem like something I should do? Probably not. Especially when there's this other guy who has actually not treated me like shit, but treated me really well. And actually I like him. So they mention how the boss character played by Fred McMurray says to his employee Baxter, you know how it is. You see a girl a couple of times a week just for laughs. And right away, she thinks you're going to divorce your wife. I ask you, is that fair? No, sir. That's very unfair, especially to your wife. And I hear that and go, yeah, it is kind of strange for a woman to see a married man hooking up with them and think that he's going to leave his wife. The article continues that Fran is a sometimes wise, sometimes naive young working woman caught between the old-fashioned values of the Eisenhower era and the swinging sexual revolution to come. When Sheldrake belittles her for not being a good sport after he confesses that he doesn't actually plan to leave his wife, a tear-stricken Fran deadpans, you'd think I would have learned by now, when you're in love with a married man, you shouldn't wear mascara. Yeah, bitch, you should have learned that married men don't leave their wives and now 
now you have. How is this patriarchy? How is this sexist in any way? This is fucking life. You have a relationship with someone who treats you badly for whatever reason, and you learn to spot those people. You try to learn from your mistakes. Some people, it takes them a while. I'm skipping over the parts that just reference the movie and just focusing on the juicy patriarchy bits. She's referenced the fact that after Fran has her suicide attempt, she and Baxter stay in for the weekend and he nurses her back to health and that's when they bond and start to fall for each other for real. So as Baxter delights in nursing Fran back to health, he attempts to take a one foot in, one foot out approach to patriarchy. He wants to win Fran's love without giving up any of the privileges he's gained from the boys club that oppressed her in the first place. At one point he heads to Sheldrake's office to negotiate taking Fran off his hands, never mind that Baxter hasn't talked to her about what she wants in any of this. It's there that Baxter finally sees firsthand the extent of Sheldrake's cavalier cruelty. Okay, so again, how is she oppressed? She decided to have an affair with an executive at her company. She could have had an affair with a man more on her level, like Baxter. She could choose to date any man she wants. She's cute enough, nice enough. She chose this guy. She's not being oppressed. He's a dick. He's cheating on his wife. That is not fucking oppression. Fuck. And so what if Baxter goes to Sheldrake to talk about Fran? It's not like Baxter's gonna go back and just like take what he wants. He's having a discussion about the topic with Sheldrake and then he'll go be like, hey Fran, do you want to be my girlfriend? And she can be like, yes or no. Like many a rom-com hero, Baxter has to self-actualize before he can prove worthy of his love interest. In this case, that means realizing there's no way to reform consolidated life from within. His only hope of being a mensch is to leave the whole corrupt system, including its privileges behind and let Fran make her own choices about who she wants to be with. I'm pretty sure he was gonna do that from the beginning, like I just said. But again, this has nothing to do with toxic masculinity or patriarchy. He was working a shit job at a corrupt company and he realized that he was compromising his integrity by working there, by allowing the executives to use his apartment, and there was no way to get out of it except to leave because he couldn't back off from what he had already promised these people. And he was never really gonna get ahead without continuing to compromise his integrity, and especially now that he'd actually gotten to know Fran and she was not just this crush in the elevator, he couldn't bear the thought of her being treated that way. So yeah, he decided to be a fucking human being, which has nothing to do with oppression and patriarchy. He was part of a shitty thing and he wanted to not be part of a shitty thing, and he did that. Also, can we talk about what a story is? Characters have to have somewhere to go. He can't just start out as this guy who just gets that he shouldn't be working as part of this corrupt system. Like, he had to be part of the corrupt system so he could have something to learn and then grow and like earn his happy ending. It wouldn't be a story if we're just like, so some executives wanted him to agree to this arrangement and he was like, no bro, that's not right. There wouldn't be a fucking movie. Like, like, what the fuck? And so this writer concludes, six decades later, it remains an impressively relevant story of two cogs in a capitalistic patriarchal machine who decide the only way to truly live a good life is to escape the old system and build a new one, even if they have to start with nothing more than a bottle of champagne and a deck of playing cards. Why is it patriarchal? Just because men are at the top? Like if women were at the top and it was women that were like asking some young woman to use her apartment for affairs, would it be matriarchal? or would it still be patriarchal? Someone please explain that to me. And of course they use capitalistic as like a slur. Corporate is not the same as capitalistic. A small business is capitalistic. Corporate culture is something different. And that kind of massive blow to corporation is subject to abuses of power, corruptions within the system. Yes, if you're not one of the executives, you're pretty much a cog. And they decided they didn't want that life. It didn't fit with their values. It wasn't bringing them happiness. They now found each other. Will they live happily ever after? Who knows? We don't get to see that part. We just know they like each other and they're gonna be together for right now. That's all we need. If you haven't seen The Apartment, you should definitely go watch it. I would recommend it to anyone who likes romantic comedies or anyone who just likes good films. If you don't know, Billy Wilder also did Some Like It Hot, among other films. Go Forth. It is funny, poignant, it has a heartwarming ending, but it has a very strong dose of cynicism the writing is really sharp. If I was describing the apartment to someone, toxic masculinity would not even be on the list of things that I mentioned about the 
film. I would say that it's a dark romantic comedy, a cynical romantic comedy about two lonely people who are stuck in a rut, drifting through life, engaged in patterns of behavior that aren't making them happy, aren't serving them, aren't moving them forward. And through the luck of life, they find each other. And the movie is about the process of them believing that they deserve each other because they both are stuck in this place where neither of them thinks that they really deserve to be happy or deserve love. But when they both show each other kindness, it sticks. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe. And I hope to have more content for you very soon.